This morning, I'm continuing this series. We're almost done with it. People are asking how many more we have. It's this Sunday and next Sunday. So the end of September, we'll end this series on, on classic rock. And we've talked about different musicians and bands. And we've taken song titles and used those um, it, for the sermon titles, song titles for the sermon titles. So this morning, the king himself, Elvis Presley, was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, in 1935. He moved to Memphis, Tennessee when he was 13 years old, and his music career began in 1954 when he began recording records at a local Memphis uh, record company called Sun Records. He was so popular that the ne next year, 1955, RCA purchased Elvis's contract. And in the first year of Elvis's contract with RCA, they sold 10 million Elvis singles in the first year. Elvis was rock and roll. Even John Lennon himself said, before Elvis, there was nothing. So Elvis Presley sort of was rock and roll. In 1958, Elvis was drafted into the army, if you can believe that, at the height of his fame and popularity. He was drafted in the army. He served two years in the army. And then he got out in 1960, and when he got out, he transitioned his career. He went, away, he went away from concerts, and he exclusively did movies and movie soundtracks. And so for about eight or nine years, all Elvis did was movies, one sort of Elvis picture after the next, none of them winning any Academy Awards. So uh, he did movies. In the late 60s, Elvis transitioned back to live performances and concerts. And he did that, and his popularity remained as, as big as it ever was. In 1973, Elvis Presley gave the first concert by a solo artist to be broadcast around the world. So he continued touring in the 70s. However, in 1977, his, his body and his health compromised by years of prescription drug abuse. Elvis Presley died at his Graceland home at the age of only 42. All that to say, this song was one of Elvis's most popular songs. It's actually from a movie. It was not recorded as part of, a, a part of albums. It was part of a movie soundtrack. Towards the end of his career and life and concert performances, he started singing this song last for a number of years in the late 70s and, or late 60s and early 70s, Elvis closed every concert with this song. And in fact, at the last concert he ever performed before his untimely death, this is the last song that Elvis ever performed live because it was the final song at the final concert. From the 1961 movie Blue Hawaii, this is Can't Help Falling in Love by Elvis Presley. You may be surprised where we go. Turn, if you will, to Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2. Hosea 1 and verse 2, it's in the Old Testament, the minor prophet Hosea. Hosea 1 and 2. <clears throat> when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry for the land for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord so Hosea went and took Gomer and she conceived and bore him a son let's pray Lord we ask in the next few minutes that you will speak to each of us that you will show us and remind us your great love for each of us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love has been the focus for almost every human on planet Earth since the moment that humans existed on planet Earth. Cave drawings and ancient sculptures of love. Paintings and books, sonnets by Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Shakespeare's a pretty good writer. <laughs> he books, songs, can't help falling in love. And of course, movies themselves, all dealing with the subject of love. Movies like Love Actually, P 
P.S. I love you. Punch drunk love down with love. Love crazy, crazy stupid love. Love, love, love. A lot like love. Eat, pray love. From Russia with love. From Paris with love. To Paris with love. <laughs> Different things happening there in Paris, right? I love you to death. Love in the afternoon. The edge of love. Love in the time of cholera. And of course, a love story. Over and over and over and over and over again, for more than 100 years, Hollywood has continued to tell us or tried to tell us about love. Songs, books, sonnets, plays, sculptures, drawings, love, love, love. The problem is not our understanding of love for each other. We understand love for each other. What we don't always do is love each other. That's not what this sermon is about. Love for each other, that's a different sermon for a different time. What I talk about today is God's love for us. God's love for us. And here's the problem with us trying to understand God's love for us. We see God's love for us through the prism of our love for everybody else. You see, and it's a skewed idea because we're not God. We're not perfect. We're not holy. Our love is very changeable. Our love can be temporary. Our love, I think of the people, the girls from high school that I thought I was in love with. That was not true. I think of all those things, we, and our love for others is based on our interactions, right, or what they do. So I love Tyler, care about him, but then Tyler does something to disappoint me, right? And so we go, well, maybe, maybe I don't love Tyler, right? So then what happens what happens? We do something to disappoint God. We sin. We allow addiction to remain in our life. And what we say to ourselves is, maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe God doesn't love me because my love for others is temporary and changeable. Therefore, what? Maybe God's love for me is temporary and changeable. The greatest expression of God's love for us I would argue, is actually found in this little prophecy from the Old Testament, which we call Hosea. And that's what I want to look at this morning. We read the verse, but I want to make sure everybody is clear. God speaks to Hosea, and he says, Hosea, I want you to be a prophet of mine. I want you to say and do the words that I give you and do the things that I tell you to do. You are my prophet. You speak for me. And Hosea says, great, what do you want me to do, God? God says, I want you to go down to the red light district, find a prostitute, marry her, and have a family with this prostitute. We're not going to get into that, but I just want you to understand, <laughs> that had to feel, uh, what? wait a minute, God, what do you want me to do? I thought I was going to like you know, give your word to the crowd and your prophecy. You want me to do that? And God says, that's your calling. That's what I want you to do. That's where we find this. We won't read the verses. Hosea goes and finds his wife, Gomer, and they have three children. I want you to see what God says. Look at Hosea chapter 2. Hosea 2 and verse 14. God is speaking about the children of Israel, but the prophecy holds true for all of us. He is speaking about his love for humanity. Hosea 2 and 14, therefore behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. The first thing that we see about who God is, is that God's love is a renewing love. The love of God is a renewing love. I want you to see all of the stuff. And he says, I will bring her to the wilderness, to the desert. And yet what? She will have vineyards in the desert. It is a renewal. The desert becomes vineyards. Look again, you may not know it in verse 15. And the valley of Achor, we know this from other places in the Old Testament 
from when the children inherited the promised land, one man committed sin in the, in the looting of Jericho. He stole things from Jericho that he wasn't supposed to take. And he and his family were punished for it. And they were punished in this valley. And it was named for that moment. Acor means trouble. The valley of trouble. The valley of sin. The valley of disappointment. The valley of stuff that we have done. Mistakes that we have made. Addictions that we have allowed to remain. But the valley of trouble in the presence of God, what? Becomes a door of hope. It becomes a door of hope. God's love is a renewing love. We are no longer who we were. We no longer do what we used to do. He loves us, and in the loving process, we are changed. We are transformed. I remember when our oldest son, Mark, he's 23 now. I still have trouble believing that at times, but he's 23 now. When our oldest son, Mark, was about to turn 10, he was super, super super excited about turning 10. I'm not sure what it was about 10 that appealed to him. I never could understand it. Me and Courtney talked about it. I think it was the idea of going from a single digit age to a double digit age. But whatever it was, Mark was excited to turn 10. And I said, Mark, help me understand what's going to happen when you turn 10. He said, dad, when I turn 10, I'm going to be a whole new person. (laughs) Listen to me. That is the renewing love of God. That is the renewing love of God. You can turn there if you want, but look at Revelation 21 and 5. This is talking about who Jesus is. Revelation 21 and 5, and it says, Then he who sat on the throne, that is Jesus, and Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. That does not happen at the end. That happens right now in this moment. God's love makes you new. It transforms you. It is, it is vineyards in the desert. It is the valley of trouble becomes the door of hope. It is God's love love makes us a whole new person. Behold, Jesus says, I make all things new. And that includes you. His love is a renewing love. Next, stay, remain in Hosea. Look at the next verse. Hosea 2 and 16. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and no longer call me my master. It's an interesting verse, isn't it? It, That verse implies a new and radically different level of intimacy that the children of Israel have not known. He says, you'll no longer call me master. You will call me husband. That is intimate. That is a connection. That is relationship. How many of you remember the old television show, I Dream of Jeannie? I Dream of Jeannie. I, ever, I remember, I used to watch reruns. Everybody knows the theme song. Don't act like you don't know the theme song to I Dream of Jeannie. All right, so we remember I Dream of Jeannie, right? Captain Nelson, right? Captain Nelson is an astronaut, and he crash lands on a, in a desert or somewhere far away, and he finds a bottle, rubs the bottle, and out, drop, out pops a beautiful genie played by Barbara Eden, right? And she has misadventures with Captain Nelson. Because he rubbed the bottle and released her, throughout the program, she calls him master, 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 right? Captain Nelson. And so he has to hide Jeannie from his associates at, the, at NASA and all of these things. He's an astronaut. Towards the end of the series, Jeannie and Captain Nelson got married. And after they got married, the writers of the show felt really, really uncomfortable with Jeannie continuing to refer to Captain Nelson as master because they were married. So after the marriage episode on I Dream of Jeannie, Jeannie never ever again refers to Captain Nelson as master. She doesn't call him that anymore. That is literally what this verse is talking about. He says, look, this is, he says, my love is a restoring love. 
He says, previously it was a redeeming love, but now my love is a restoring love. It restores the relationship. You used to call me master, but now you call me husband. Now we are in relationship. Now we love each other. Now the, the, the separation between us and God has been restored. First we are renewed, but then we are restored. Look, if you will, at verses down from that. I want you to hear the language of God. As we said, Shakespeare writes sonnets that are beautiful and remember, but listen to the language of love that God uses in Hosea 2 and 19. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. That is a restoring love. I will betroth you to me forever. No matter what we do, no matter how we act, no matter the problems, no matter the things that we go back to, no matter the dumb mistakes that we make, no matter the sins we commit, I will betroth you to me forever. It is, it is a restoring love, no longer at arm's length. Jesus illustrates this himself. Look, if you will, at John chapter 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15. Jesus tells his disciples this. Look at John 15 and 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now look at 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. He says, no longer are we servant and master. What does he say? But I have called you friends. The Old Testament and the New Testament in that moment meet. God says through Hosea, no longer master, but husband. Jesus says to the disciples, no longer servants, but friends. It is, it is a restoring love, a renewing love and a restoring love. Now, the book of Hosea is both narrative and prophecy. The narrative involves Hosea going, finding this woman who's a prostitute, marrying her, having babies. And then the prophecy starts that we just read some of. And then the narrative to Hosea's life returns. It does not tell us this, but it's obvious. Gomer has abandoned Hosea, abandoned the children, and she has returned to a life of prostitution. After being rescued, after being saved, after being pulled out, she returns to her old life. She returns to her old ways, to her old sin, to her old addiction. What we assume, because we view God's love through the prism of our love for each other, what we assume is that God says we're finished with her. Just like when we sin, God says, we're finished with you. But that is not who God is. You have to get a hold of this. You have to know it. That is not who God is. That's not what he's about. That's not his essence. That's not his character. That's not his DNA. God is love. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter the mistakes that we've made, God is love. And Gomer leaves and abandons Hosea and the kids and returns to her old life. Look at three and one. Hosea 3 and 1, then the Lord said to me, Hosea speaking, then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. The next thing that we see about God's love is that God's love is a reclaiming love. He reclaims us. He does not abandon us in our sin. We wander far away from the presence of God. And what we expect is that God says, well, if you want to come back, you know where to find me. That is not who God is. He goes and actively seeks us. He reclaims us. He pulls us out of the clay and the mire. He pulls us out of the blackness. He pulls us from darkness to light. He pulls us from death to life. He pulls us from sin to grace. He goes and reclaims us. 
So many people, the, the, that song that we sing, the overwhelming and never-ending love of God, where, he, where he, he, it's, it's reckless, right, Luke? Isn't that what it says? It's the reckless love of God. Listen to me. <laughs> God's love only looks reckless if you're the 99. If you are the one far from God, lost in sin, buried under your own addictions, God coming and finding you and reclaiming you is not reckless. It's not reckless. We have to get a hold of that. He, he finds us. He tears down the mountains. He, he knocks down the doors. We might have to sing that at the end. We'll sing a bunch at the end. I don't know what we're going to do, but listen to me. It is a reclaiming love. The love of God reclaims us. He is unwilling. He is unwilling that any of us should perish. He's unwilling. It's the love of God. The love of God. See, when someone hurts me, when someone disappoints you, Gomer leaves Hosea, abandons him and the kids and returns to prostitution, returns to the old life. And we in our humanity say, I'm done with that person. It's over. I'm not letting them in my life anymore. And because we say that about each other, we assume that God says that about us. But he says, I will go and reclaim the lost sheep. I will find those who are buried. I will find those who are gone. It is, it is that reclaiming love of God where he, he pulls us out. He reclaims us. I, the country of Holland or the Netherlands, it's an interesting country with more than one name, Holland, the Netherlands, and their people are known as the Dutch. What sense does that make? <laughs> That's the craziest country you ever heard of. Holland, no, the Netherlands. Oh, who are the Dutch? So they're all the same, right? <laughs> Holland primarily, I want you to see this, 65% of the country of Holland would be underwater if at high tide. If it was at high tide, if it wasn't for the pumping system and the, the, the dunes and the dikes and all these things that they've built to keep the water out, 65% of the land mass of Holland would be underwater at high tide. I want you to see this map of how the Dutch have reclaimed the land of, of Holland. This is, this is what Holland looked like 700 years ago. This is what it looks like now at the end of 2000. Isn't that amazing? In, in, since in the, that, what that represents right there, that map, 17% of the total land area of the Netherlands is land reclaimed from the sea. The Dutch said, we have to have more land, and they literally pump the water out and make land where they can have farming and people can live. And that's what the country looks like now, 17% bigger in land mass because they have reclaimed the land from the sea. In the same way, God's love is a reclaiming love. He is unwilling to just let the ocean of sin and addiction wash over us. He goes out there and he pulls us out and he reclaims us and he says, you are mine and I'm taking you and I'm reclaiming you. We, we have lost, we have lost that in, in some ways in, in the church. There is a call and a need for holiness. I am not letting that off the hook. We need to look and act and behave different. We are called to be different. But my concern is in the teaching of holiness, we have lost or we have de-emphasized God's wonderful, amazing, never-ending, never-ceasing love, his love for us. You cannot run far enough where he will not reclaim you, where he will not find you. And God says to Hosea, go and find your wife. Look at Hosea 3 and verse 2. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. Gomer's life has descended into absolute brokenness. She returns to a life of prostitution. She gets older. Time passes. 
She can no longer even do that. And her pimp sells her as a slave. You say, well, this wasn't what I expected on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, it should be. <laughs> I've been here for seven years. You never know what I'm going to say. <laughs> he sells her into slavery. I want you to understand the image because I want you to understand what's happening. In these ancient times, all slaves, men or women, are sold naked. All slaves up on the auction block, sold naked like animals. This old woman comes up on the auction block naked. She is broken. She is finished. She's defeated. Life has destroyed her. Her one chance at happiness with a prophet named Hosea is gone because of her own addiction and her own sin. She has chosen her fate, and her fate is to be sold into slavery. Naked and alone on that auction block. She stands there, shivering. And the slave auctioner says, Well, I'm not going to fool myself. Who'll give me five shekels of silver? And the men waiting to bid on slaves chuckle in derision. Nobody's given him five shekels of silver for this old used up woman. He says, Give me four. Three, gentlemen, who will give me three? Two, one shekel of silver. Who will pay the price? And all of a sudden, an old man in the back begins to make his way through the crowd. And he says, 15, 15 shekels of silver. Give me my wife back. I want her. He pushes his way through the crowd. He throws the money at the man's feet. He comes up on the auction block. He covers her with a blanket. And he says, let's go home. Our God's love is a redeeming love. God's love is a redeeming love. He redeems us out of our sin, out of our addiction. He buys us on the auction block. We have been purchased at a great price. We have been purchased at a great price. The blood of his son on the cross for my sin, for your sin. His love is a redeeming love. He redeems us at a high price. He is unwilling that any should perish. I want you to understand this. Other people will fail you. This love will always disappoint you. This love never fails. It never ceases. It never quits. He never gives up on us. This love is a redeeming love. He redeems us out of our own sin and addiction and mistakes. Gomer wasn't there because unjustly. She wasn't being sold as a slave unjustly. She wasn't being punished for nothing. She had chosen that. And yet, God redeems her as he redeems us. No matter what you've done, God loves you. No matter what you were doing last night, no matter how you've talked or spoken or acted, no matter what your past is, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, you are not broken irrevocably. You cannot be redeemed. There is no one that cannot be redeemed by the love of God. You can be redeemed. Look, look at what Paul tells us in Romans. Romans 5 and 5. If you've been here, you've heard me quote this scripture. Maybe one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Romans 5 and 5. Paul says, now hope does not disappoint. Why does hope not disappoint? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is redeemed at a great price. He loved us so much while we were yet sinners, still sinners. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Or redeemed, we shall be redeemed by his life. 
while we were still sinners, God demonstrates his love to us in that he sent his son to die for our sins. The love of God. It's so much more wonderful, so much better, so much bigger, so much more awesome, so much more amazing than we could ever think of or imagine. What we assume is, I've hurt and disappointed everybody I've ever known. They all hate me. I've hurt and disappointed God, so he must hate me too. And God says, no, I restore you, I renew you, I redeem you. I pull you out. You are reclaimed. I am unwilling to let you go. You are reclaimed. You are redeemed. You are bought at a great price. So many of us, life and our past happens to us, and we believe the lie that we are useless and unredeemable, that we have no worth Listen to me, each of you, each of us, myself included, we are the most expensive item in the store. We have been redeemed. The purchase price for each of us is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We have been redeemed. You have been purchased at a great price. Let me close with this. I've shared this little story before, but I love it. A number of years ago, I read an article about the, number, num, the top things that Americans wanted to hear. Americans wanted to hear this. So they polled like, I don't know, 1,000 people, 5,000 people. They did this poll nationwide of what are the top things that Americans want to hear. And after talking to thousands of people, the top three answers were clear. The three, top three answers were clear. The first one, I bet you can guess. The first one that every American wants to hear, the number one answer was, I love you. I love you. That's the number one thing that Americans want to hear. I love you. Number two, it didn't surprise me much either. I forgive you. The number two thing that Americans want to hear is, I forgive you. I love you, I forgive you. Number three made me laugh. Number three thing that Americans want to hear, dinner's ready. <laughs> they must have polled Restoration Church. <laughs> We's the eatingest bunch of Christians I've ever met. <laughs> I love you, I forgive you, dinner's ready. And I looked at it for a second and I realized that is communion. That is communion. We are receiving communion today. And as we receive communion, that is what God through his son Jesus is saying to each of us. I love you. I forgive you. Come and dine. I love you. I forgive you. Dinner's ready. I'm going to release the ushers, if they will, to prepare the elements. In just a moment, they're going to make their way through. I want you to hold the elements until everyone is received and we're going to receive communion together. When communion has been received, we're going to open these altars and I'm going to give you the opportunity to just come to the front and pray about whatever it is. My feeling is that most of us need to be reminded on a pretty regular basis how much God loves us. I probably should preach this message about every three weeks because about every three weeks I've done enough stuff where I need to be reminded of how much God loves me. My feeling is, so do all of you. God says, I love you. I forgive you. Dinner's ready. As you hold these elements, as you hold these elements, I want you to focus on how much he loves you. What we focus on is our past and our sin and our addiction and all the stuff we've done bad. We view the entire universe through the keyhole of our mistakes. Listen to me. Open your mind. Broaden your vision. 
quit focusing on your past and your sin and all that stuff. Focus on the love of God. While we were still sinners, God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us, for you, for me. Focus on it. As we hold the elements, think about and focus on God loves me. The ushers will make their way forward. I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to receive your communion. This last supper, we thank you for your love. Your love transformed each of us and your love is illustrated no place more wonderfully than in this communion that we receive. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.